Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction on some of the biomarkers that we frequently use in uh, diagnostic neuropathology. And, uh, and then I think you'll hear later on from David Lewis how those biomarkers are being used in the newest WHO classification, why we made certain decisions as we did. And I think you'll hear from uh, Cynthia Hawkins specifically about pediatric gliomas and, and maybe some of the other pediatric tumors. So I have no disclosures. And we're going to focus on the uh, gliomas during this talk. Uh, as you probably know, uh, in the United States, we see about 100,000 new cases of brain tumors every year. Uh, gliomas, uh, the brain tumors are the most common cause now, unfortunately, of cancer death in children. Uh, and uh, much of what we see in the adults is supertentorial, whereas in uh, children it's, it's uh, infratentorial. You've heard a little bit about some of those tumors, and you'll hear some more the rest of the day. <clears throat> so we're going to focus on the gliomas, and uh, this is the, some of the notice, uh, latest epidemiology data. Let's see if this is working. I'll just do it here. Here we go. So about a little less than half of the uh, gliomas that we see, unfortunately, are the glioblastomas. And uh, about, whoops, let me go back, about 80% of all the malignant uh, tumors are accounted for by the gliomas that we encounter. Uh, now, you will hear a lot more about this from David Lewis, but uh, just earlier in the year, we released a uh, updated version of the, f the fourth edition of the WHO Blue Book. There's been actually a lot of changes uh, in terms of incorporating molecular definitions, and we'll just touch on some of those, and I'll, I'll leave most of that to David. Uh, I would say, though, I think we've for a long time been shifting somewhat as pathologists in terms of our focus. And uh, in the early part of the last century, for example, I think as pathologists we were more uh, intellectuals about comparing cancer cells with what we thought the normal counterparts would be. And uh, basically grading, for example, was, was an exercise in how much a cancer cell resembles the normal. So the more it resembled the normal situation, the lower the grade, and the less it resembled it, the higher the grade. But really, I think we're much more practical now, and what our clinical colleagues will prefer from us is that we try to predict in an individual patient how, how aggressive a tumor is going to be, and that will obviously dictate the therapy. So this is kind of where we're moving with the WHO as well, with the uh, grading basically being grade one is benign or potentially curable, uh, grade two a low-grade malignancy, three is uh, usually has the, the adjective anaplastic next to it, and the grade four is the highest grade malignancy for which glioblastoma is the prototype. So David will talk a lot more about this, uh, but I'm going to focus specifically on the left-hand side of the WHO scheme. These two pages actually are the entire WHO scheme, and as David uh, likes to say, the rest of the book is commentary on these two pages. So we're going to focus on just a little bit of the classification scheme. So let's just take a step back and uh, just review a little bit about kind of what the traditional pathology has been and still a lot of what we do. Uh, so uh, astrocytomas uh, have long been defined by the fact that they have irregular hyperchromatic nuclei. You can see reactive astrocytes next to them in comparison. And we still look at this and say, well, this is kind of what an astrocytoma should look like in the classic situation. Sorry. Uh, and with mitotic activity, we call them grade three. The glioblastomas, of course, are much more common, unfortunately. And they're characterized by either microvascular proliferation with these glomeruloid formations, complex microvascular formations, uh, probably, in, in my opinion, the multi-layering is perhaps more important. Uh, whereas the necrosis is the other feature that identifies grade four tumors uh, in the gliomas, and they're often in the glioblastomas, 
have this palisading character somewhat like what you're seeing with the kiwi on the right. Okay. Oligodendroglioma, this is all review, of course. They tend to be more cortically based, as you see here. Uh, and in the really nice classic example, they have the fried egg appearance, with, uh, but, but uh, this is a formal and fixed artifact, so if you're still in the last lecture and doing frozen sections, you're not gonna see that on your frozen sections. So more importantly, perhaps, for morpho morphologic criteria is the monomorphism of these round, regular nuclei. And uh, this is how we've been practicing for many, many years. And this is basically the definitions that we've had. The uh, vasculature is often a little different than the oligodendrogliomas. In terms of this chicken wire-like branching of capillaries, as you see here. And in the higher grade cases, the grade three oligodendrogliomas, they often, the cells will become bigger, more epithelioid, more mitotically active, and you again start to see things like microvascular proliferation. So it's all well and good, and this is how we've been practicing for many, many years. But over the last decade or more, uh, we've identified some, some uh, things that make us want to go beyond just the microscope, I think. And one is if you take a single diagnostic entity, in this case glioblastoma, and you do uh, genomic analyses of these tumors, despite the fact that, relatively speaking, they all look morphologically the same, it seems that we have at least six distinct molecular subtypes. And at least some of these have distinct clinical implications. Some are much more aggressive, some less aggressive, uh, some much more commonly encountered in kids, others much more commonly encountered in older adults, et cetera. Uh, and we'll talk about IDH and uh, some of these other markers a little bit later. But uh, this is one of the issues. So despite the fact that they look relatively the same under the microscope, they're heterogeneous in terms of molecular and clinical behavior. Another big problem that we face is that we, even, even among the experts that we have in neuropathology, we argue. We often don't agree on, on exactly what is the minimum criteria. So when everything is classic, there's not a problem and we all agree. But as you all know, a lot of these gliomas uh, are, are not, don't, don't fit neatly into one category or another. So, uh, I think this is a little bit of an extreme, but it, it makes the point. And that is in the EORTC trial from a number of years ago, uh, they looked at anaplastic oligodendrogliomas and anaplastic mixed tumors. And you see that among nine panelists, they agreed on anaplastic oligodendroglioma only in about half of cases. They agreed on anaplastic oligoastrocytomas in 8% of cases. Now this is, by definition, not, not a reproducible diagnosis, if only 8% of us are agreeing about it. So this is the other big problem with using morphology by itself. So uh, many of us now have, for quite a long time, been using biomarkers to help increase the accuracy of our diagnoses, and uh, the newest WHO is, is really a, a matter of, of which ones are ready for prime time for, uh, for routine use by everybody. So I'm gonna talk about the most common biomarkers that we use, and whenever I talk about biomarkers of any type, you should immediately think, is this a diagnostic biomarker, prognostic biomarker, predictive biomarker that guides therapy, or some combination of the three. And then, of course, if you're running a pathology lab, the things you also think about is what are the cost and ease of implementation, reimbursement, and things like that. All right. So what we're, we've all been wanting to move towards over the last uh, number of years, and we're not, still not quite there, but is uh, personalized medicine, targeted therapy. We all hear these words all the time. Uh, this is actually from a paper on, on lung cancer, but it, it makes the same point when you're talking about gliomas. Whereas in the old days, like when I was a resident, people always told me, why do you want to go into neuropathology? All brain tumors are bad. They, they all do horribly and patients die. 
Well, that's, that's a big overgeneralization, and we, we all know that. So everybody's kind of lumped into the same pool. Today, I think, you know, maybe we look at uh, oligodendrogliomas with IDH mutation and 1P19Q codeletion, and this is a much more uniform group, but even within that set, there's some individual variability. And maybe the IDH wild type, glioblastomas, et cetera, we're not yet at the point where every individual patient is treated specifically for his uh, tumor, the unique aspects of his or her tumor. All right, and I can't help uh, steal this slide from my friend Peter Vesseling. So all this has to be taken into context, right? We're not gonna throw away the morphology. We're gonna put it all into context. A fool with a molecular tool is still a fool. So everything is just a tool and we're just going to improve what, we're already, what we've already been doing. All right, so let's kind of take a historical perspective. What are the biomarkers we've been using the longest? And then we'll, we'll get to the most recent ones. Well, the one we've been using certainly the longest by far is 1P19Q testing in oligodendrogliomas. So remember our question. Is this diagnostic, prognostic, or predictive? Now in this case, this is probably the only biomarker that we use that you could argue is all three, right? So it's, it's diagnostic because it's highly correlated with the classic histologic appearance of oligodendrogliomas in adults. The pediatric cases are, are a little bit of an exception, but in adults. Uh, and in fact, in the new WHO, this is now a requirement. So you cannot call the common adult-type oligodendroglioma if you don't have co-deletions of 1P and 19Q. It's prognostic because those are among the, the best behaving uh, gliomas that we encounter. And it took a long time to answer this question, but it is in fact predictive. If you follow the patients out far enough, those that are treated with alkylating chemotherapy uh, agents and radiation uh, clearly have a better prognosis. So it's all three. Now, uh, most of us nowadays will do fish testing or LOH analysis, um, depending what, uh, what is easiest in our own hospital laboratories. Uh, I think more and more in the future, some of the high throughput genomic techniques will maybe replace these. So for example, you can do next generation sequencing and have copy number algorithms that will, will give you, in addition to everything else, all the mutation analyses will, will let you know that there's clearly 1P and 19Q co-deletion as you see here. Okay, so other uh, uh, markers that have been around for quite a long time include EGFR amplification and chromosome 10 losses, including the P10 region on chromosome 10. These are uh, certainly diagnostic markers for glioblastoma, and they're not necessarily in, in routine use, but we certainly use them in a diagnostic fashion. Um, we, a lot of papers have looked, are they independently prognostic? The pro probably the answer is no, at least at this point. And uh, predictive, still after many, many years, people are trying, especially targeting EGFR amplifications uh, or the EGFR V3 specific uh, alteration, the, the type of uh, uh, mutation that, that deletes part of the EGFR uh, receptor. So probably at this point I would say it's, it's really mostly diagnostic, and, and, uh, but it's not definitional. These things can be seen in other tumors besides GBM. So this is not part of the definition of GBM in, in the latest WHO. Similarly, there was a huge amount of excitement about 10 years ago when the story broke about MGMT methylation testing and its association with prognosis. So is this a diagnostic marker? Absolutely no. Many, many tumors throughout the body in the CNS and outside the CNS will inactivate the MGMT gene through methylation of the promoter region. Is it prognostic? Absolutely yes. So this is a, a very useful prognostic marker for glioblastomas. And you could argue probably it's predictive because we know that glioblastoma patients 
uh, whose tumors have MGMT hypermethylation uh, will be more likely to respond to temozolomide and other alkylating chemotherapy agents. The problem is if you ask most oncologists, well, if it's negative, does not have MGMT methylation, what are you going to treat the patient with? The answer almost always is, is, is temozolomide. And unfortunately, we don't have that many other good options, and at least a subset of those patients still respond to temozolomide. So it's mostly a prognostic marker. Because of that, it is not part of the definitions for any of the uh, tumors we have in the WHO. That doesn't mean it's not an important marker. It is part of our daily uh, routine testing that we do at UCSF and, and many places. All of our oncologists want that information, uh, but it is not a definitional marker. It's not a disease-defining alteration. So it was hoped when this originally came out that we could just use immunohistochemistry. Turns out that's not a very reliable technique. There's always a lot of admixed normal. It can be difficult to interpret, uh, and it doesn't correlate as much with outcome and response to, to therapy. So most people still have to do molecular techniques for MGMT testing. Uh, and there's, unfortunately, this is, this is the assay that I think is the dirtiest right now, and there's a lot of variability on how people do it and, and our definitions of what's positive and what's negative. Um, and so there's still a lot of questions out there. And in fact, sometimes one part of a GBM will be methylated, another will not. It may be methylated in the primary and not me methylated in the recurrence. Uh, and depending, depending on cutoffs, one lab may call it methylated and another will not. So, uh, and again, also techniques are different. The other issue is that there's almost 100 CPG islands in the promoter region of MGMT. So which ones are the ones that are critical for testing? And what does it mean when some are methylated and others are not, which is a very common situation? Uh, so I can just tell you what we do. Uh, we do Sanger sequencing after bisulfite treatment. We look at 17 of the CPG islands, and we score from 0 to 17, depending how many of those CPG islands are positive. Um, so a 1 is a positive, but at least our oncologists know, well, yeah, it's positive, but it's barely methylated. And what exactly does that mean? We don't really know. Okay. Much more revolutionary, I think, was this, was this report in 2008 by uh, the uh, investigators at Duke and uh, Hopkins and many other places. And they were doing genomic analyses on glioblastomas and found a number of the alterations that many of us already knew for many years existed. But they found one that was very surprising. And that was that about 10% of cases had mutations in a, a gene called IDH1, or isocitrate dehydrogenase 1. So it en encodes an enzyme that's involved in the Krebs cycle. Uh, nobody in, in particular thought this would be a particularly, you know, should be a target in GBM. But in fact, it turned out that the patients that had IDH uh, mutations, IDH1 mutations, they had a much better survival. They tended to be younger. They tended to have lower grade precursors that then progressed to GBM. And lo and behold, when people looked at lower grade gliomas, both astrocytomas and oligodendrogliomas, uh, up to 80% or more of those tumors had these IDH mutations. Most of them involved IDH1, a much smaller percent involved a homologous uh, gene called IDH2. So this, in fact, is probably the most common, single most common mutation in a very large group of diffuse gliomas. Uh, and in fact, 90% of all the IDH1 and 2 mutations occur as a point mutation in IDH1 that converts arginine to histidine in codon 132. And there are now immunostains available that detect that mutant protein. So this is a very useful diagnostic marker because non-neoplastic cells are never going to express this mutant protein. And if we see it, like in this case of minimally atypical glial pr proliferation, 
that is a glioma. We don't have to wonder about it anymore. Is this, is this a reactive process or is it a glioma? So we use it very frequently. It's also prognostic because these patients do better. So in fact, we use it on all of our diffuse gliomas uh, or virtually all of them. It's a very useful marker. Uh, here's another way that it can be used in a diagnostic fashion and that is that anaplastic oligodendrogliomas and one variant of glioblastoma, the small cell uh, variant of glioblastoma, can look remarkably similar, and yet the biology is, is extremely different. So anaplastic oligos, the average patient, this, despite the fact that it's high grade, if it's defined as it is now in the WHO and has IDH mutation and 1P19Q codeletion, that patient has an average survival with therapy of about 15 years. A small cell GBM has an average survival like other GBMs of a year or less. So by definition, all anaplastic oligos will have IDH mutation, except that very small subset I mentioned in, in kids. Uh, and by definition, all small cell GBMs will be IDH wild type. So this is a, an absolute black and white separation between these two tumors. So you'll, you'll hear from David and find out that probably IDH mutation is the biggest stratifier that we start with in our diffuse gliomas. Now here's another uh, area where we've made a lot of progress. You heard a little bit from uh, Charles Eberhardt about tumor senescence. And in fact, all cancers have to find at least one way to escape tumor senescence if they're going to be immortal. There are at least two very common ways that cancers throughout the body do that. One is to overexpress telomerase that keeps the telomeres uh, from shortening after each cell division. Uh, and another way is called alternative lengthening of telomeres, or ALT. It turns out in, in the adults, in diffuse gliomas, uh, these are highly correlated with specific subtypes of gliomas. So, for example, in the common uh, type of glioblastoma that we see in older adults, We've known for many, many years that telomerase is overexpressed in these tumors, but only in the last uh, few years did we find what the mechanism of that was. And that is uh, one of two very common mutations in the TERT gene, not in the coding region, but in fact in the upstream uh, promoter uh, region. So this is one mechanism that occurs in glioblastomas. And in fact, the vast majority of glioblastomas, it's the most common tumor throughout the body to use this mechanism. Um, look at number three after myxoid liposarcoma is actually oligodendroglioma. So it's very interesting. The I IDH uh, mutant 1P19Q codeleted oligodendroglioma escapes senescence in the same mechanism that a glioblastoma does. So this is very interesting. So TERT. Mutations uh, would be another way to, to uh, stratify some of these tumors, although it's not a diagnosis-defining alteration because you can see many cancers use this mechanism. Uh, the less common uh, way in general in cancer, but maybe about 10% of cancers use this, uh, is the alternative lengthening of telomeres. And... Uh, at least in the uh, diffuse gliomas, it's, ver it's nearly always a mutation of, in, of a single gene that's involved in chromatin remodeling called ATRX. And uh, this is highly, uh, so here is one way that we can look for it. Alternative lengthening of telomeres leads to these very large telomeres that we can pick up by fish, telomere fish, and they look like large ultra bright signals. But of course, as pathologists, we would much rather do immunohistochemistry. And in fact, there is a good uh, uh, antibody to ATRX that many of us are already using. So remember, normally this is expressed in all nuclei. So, uh, so this is the normal situation. We're actually looking for loss of expression. So this is the positive, the loss of expression. 
Now, like INI1 protein in, ATR, in uh, ATRT, for example, you want to make sure that, that the stain is actually working if you're looking for loss of expression, right? So, sh so always look for the internal positive control. So neurons, endothelial cells, uh, uh, residual non-neoplastic glial cells or inflammatory cells, they should all be positive. If everything is negative, that's a technical failure. That's not loss of expression. Okay, so this is not a perfect correlation with, alt, with the alt phenotype, but it works in the majority of cases and uh, is a useful surrogate marker. So we now have a number of, of uh, fairly useful markers in the primary GBMs. The majority of them have these TERP mutations, uh, often with EGFR amplifications or and or mutations, chromosome 10 losses and other things. It turns out the ALT phenotype is highly correlated with astrocytomas. So oligodendrogliomas never use this mechanism. So ATRX uh, loss or mutation in association with IDH mutation, virtually always with P53 mutation, is the molecular pattern for astrocytoma. The, the grade two and grade three astrocytoma or secondary glioblastomas that arise from those lower grade precursors. And oligodendrogliomas similarly have IDH mutations, uh, but they, instead of having these ATRX losses and P53 mutations, they have TERT mutations and 1P19Q co-deletion. So we really have taken a lot of the subjectivity out of stratifying these tumors if we use at least a few of these molecular markers. So for example, with immunohistochemistry, if I have what looks like a diffuse glioma, I'm not sure if it's oligo or astro, but I get this result. It's IDH1 mutant, uh, and it's got P53 overexpression. That's another useful surrogate marker. It's, it's far from perfect, but useful. And ATRX loss. The, I don't have to do any molecular analysis beyond this. This is molecularly speaking an adult type at IDH mutant astrocytoma. That's it, I'm done. Unfortunately with oligodendrogliomas we also have the IDH mutation but we have to have the 1P19Q codeletion as well. Um, and I should mention with IDH uh, uh, immunohistochemistry, of course, we're missing some of the rarer mutations. So we, in a younger, patient, younger adult patient, someone who's had a history of lower grade glioma, uh, a long clinical history before they've developed their tumor, any of those things, uh, I suspect I may be missing the IDH mutation, then we reflex to sequencing IDH1 and IDH2. So this is kind of the practical way that we do it in, in our place. Um, you'll probably hear a lot more about this from Cynthia, but uh, there is another distinct subtype of glioma that's mainly seen in children, uh, though we certainly see it in adults as well, and uh, I've now seen them even as, as, as old as patients in their 60s, and I've heard from others in patients in their 70s. Uh, so. This is a diffuse midline glioma. It's mainly the, the big association is with location. And so a high percentage of the diffuse pontine gliomas, thalamic gliomas, spinal cord gliomas, occasionally cerebellar gliomas, uh, have these mutations in another chromatin remodeling gene, uh, histone uh, H3, and it uh, converts lysine to methionine in codon 27. So like the case with IDH1 mutant protein, <clears throat> we now have an immunostain that reli reliably picks up this mutant uh, H3K27M protein. And we can pick that up with immunohistochemistry uh, to a lesser degree than the IDH uh, mutant cases, but certainly uh, true in a subset. Many of these also have overexpression of P53 and or P53 mutation and loss of ATRX. 
So always consider this whenever you're uh, in a midline location, pons, thalamus, spinal cord. Uh, these are very aggressive no matter what grade they look like, although there's still some controversy about that. But even if it looks low grade, these tumors are likely to behave in an aggressive fashion. The WHO considers them grade four. So to give you an example, here's a 26-year-old man uh, that we, uh, with, a, with an expanded spinal cord, we got a biopsy from this uh, person a couple of years ago, and uh, the biopsy looked like this, not very cellular, uh, certainly scattered atypical uh, nuclei, somewhat irregular, hyperchromatic, suspicious for an astrocytoma. Here's the H3K27M uh, immunostain. So the nuclear positivity, those all are containing mutant protein. And in fact, there was probably 10 times more tumor cells than I ever would have guessed on the H&E. The majority of cells here are tumor cells. Okay. Um, so actually these, uh, we, we recently did a little mini series of these with one of our fellows, David Solomon, who's now on faculty. Uh, they have quite a wide spectrum of morphologic appearances and occasionally they may even look like pilocytic astrocytoma or ganglioglioma. Uh, I've seen a rare case that has perivascular pseudorosettes mimicking ependymoma. So just have a high index of suspicion for these. So we really, I think, have a lot more information now in terms of molecular pathways. IDH mutation is a big early step in many of these cases. If you add P53 and ATRX mutations, they go down the astrocytic pathway. TERP mutations and, ID and 1P19Q codeletions, they go down the oligodendroglial pathway. If they're IDH wild type and have TERP mutations and EGFR amplification or other things, GBM, IDH wild type, and this uh, rare subtype, but, but not as rare as you might think, uh, diffuse midline glioma, H3K27M mutant. So notice I didn't list oligoastrocytoma. So if you do these molecular analyses, oligoastrocytoma becomes vanishingly rare. I'm only aware of two case reports where one area of a tumor was molecularly astrocytoma and another was molecularly oligodendroglioma. So essentially, if you use the WHO 2016, oligoastrocytoma should either become extinct or, or very rare. Again, there are exceptions like everything else in the pediatric subset, and we'll probably hear from uh, Cynthia about that. Now, the other big problem we face is grading. This is also imperfect and unfortunately still remains imperfect. So we mainly use the AMEN criteria, atypia, mitosis, endothelial proliferation and necrosis. And depending how many of these we have, it's either grade two, three, or four for astrocytomas. Uh, unfortunately, all these criteria came way before we knew any of the molecular pathways. So we got to ask the question, do they still hold up in the new scheme? And we're starting to get some data that suggests maybe in some cases, no. Uh, we, it still isn't completely resolved, but here's a study from Ken Aldapi's group. And if you look at the grade two and three astrocytomas, IDH wild type, some of the things we've known for many years are prognostic. Age less than 40, age over 40, huge difference in the IDH wild type cases. IDH mutant cases, no difference whatsoever. Um, mitoses, less than or greater than four. <coughs> IDH wild type, big difference in survival. IDH uh, mutant, no difference. Grade two versus three using WHO criteria. IDH wild type, a little bit of a difference. IDH mutant, no difference at all. So think about that because that's fairly dramatic for our oncology colleagues. They've, for decades, they've been thinking grade two is low grade, grade three is high grade give different therapies for grade two versus three. This data suggests in the IDH mutant cases, this may be an artificial separation 
I'm not sure that's entirely true. Maybe just our grading criteria need to be revised. But at this point, you should just be aware of this flaw. Uh, we looked, along with our colleagues at Mayo Clinic, also at a large series of cases. And our grade twos and threes are here with IDH mutation. Our grade fours with IDH mutation are down here. So clearly the grade four, the secondary GBMs or IDH mutant GBMs still do quite a bit worse than grade two and three. So grading is still important, but there's still a lot of problems. So um, I won't go into a lot of details of this because I suspect Cynthia will cover it, but some of the other biomarkers we use in our practice are uh, the BRAF fusion that you heard about from Charles. Um, is uh, very common in pilocytic astrocytomas. It's not absolutely specific, but certainly by far most common in this group. Uh, there may, may be some data suggesting MEK inhibitors are, are useful in these cases. BRAF V600E e mutation is common in many tumors, but in the CNS, PXA and ganglioglioma are probably the most common and a rare subtype of GBM called epithelioid GBM. Uh, and BRAF inhibitors are, are, prob are, are uh, at least for a while, uh, seem to be effective in some of these patients. With, uh, like the other markers I mentioned, there is now an antibody for BRAF V600E. When it, when it works well, it's great. Sometimes it's, it's equivocal. It can be weakly positive, and you're not sure if it's background and in those cases, we reflex to sequencing. Uh, so I'll just briefly talk a little bit about ependymoma, and then we'll uh, reinforce some of this data with some of that musical uh, teaching that you heard a little bit about. So ependymomas, um, these, as you know, can occur in either kids or adults. In the adults, they're most common in the spinal cord, kids most commonly fourth ventricle or posterior fossa and supratentorial. And it turns out there are uh, different molecular groups in these as well, which I'll just touch briefly on, uh, including one subtype that's now a distinct WHO entity, the relifusion positive ependymoma, and there is an immunostain that is a, a surrogate marker, not a perfect one, but useful nonetheless. Okay, so if you look at the major locations, supratentorial, posterior fossa, spinal cord, each one of those locations has three molecular subgroups uh, in the most recent studies. And most of them have a fairly favorable prognosis except for two. One is this relifusion subtype uh, that I just mentioned, and one is in the posterior fossa, the type A, subtype that unfortunately right now we don't have a good surrogate immunostain for, although I, I know several people are, are working to try to get one. Uh, the relifusion subtype is uh, by definition a supratentorial type of ependymoma. They frequently have a clear cell histology, though not always. They often share with oligodendrogliomas this chicken wire-like capillary background. They're often anaplastic uh, if you do the traditional grading. And the L1 cam stain is a reasonably good surrogate marker. It is not absolutely specific. You can see it in other tumor types, ATRT, and a few other things, glioblastoma. But if you're sure it's an ependymoma, in the super, and it's a supratentorial ependymoma, and it's diffusely positive like this, it's almost certainly going to be the relifusion subtype. So that's basically a whirlwind tour of the biomarkers, some of the most common ones that we use. I didn't go into pediatric uh, tumor types, but uh, they will be on this song along with the gliomas. Uh, so uh, just to give you a little background, I've been a singer for well over 30 years, uh, mainly choral singer, uh, but solo as well. Um, a rock and roll band in high school, but classical music now. And I'm with an a cappella group called uh, Mosaic in San Francisco. And a little over a, a year ago, uh, we performed Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen, 
right around the time that David and Cynthia and Charles and I were working on the WHO scheme. And uh, I thought this was a perfect opportunity to use that to highlight some of these biomarkers and the, the new WHO. So I rewrote the words uh, to, and made it the brain tumor rhapsody and uh, made the first music video. So basically, let me see if we can get this to work. We haven't done a sound check, so we'll do the best we can. My friend Joey in the back is going to help, help us out. Is this an astro? Is this an onago? Some cells are rounded, but then others just aren't so. Open your eyes to future pathology. I'm just a poor boy. I have no NGS. Integrate my immune nose with histology, don't you know? Try a biomarker, it will make you smarter to me. Can't you see? Do, 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 do. tried IDA. Expressed. Now it's past this final test. Beer cow, strong P53 with loss of nuclear ATRS. Beer cow, Ooh. no deletions did we find on fish exam. My final diagnosis. Another subtype we see includes mutations of H3, K27M4C, midline. High grade astros in mostly young patients. Gotta find a way to beat this travesty. Dear Cow, with your 34 instead, cerebral GBMs are so aggressive. Past the old. Mutations of the promoter region. Do, 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 I see a small gruesome tumor in a baby. Raptoid cells, raptoid cells, do you see those pink bells? Phytotic and exciting, very, very frightening. He's just a poor boy with a bad tumor type Sparing his life from this monstrosity And Brian, tumor type, how to diagnose it? No! So you think that's the extent of our current technology? 
Jesus.